When uh, had, as Sean was talking about all the networking, when I was in school, they just said shut up instead of networking. But I guess networking is good. That's a good thing for this group. How you know we maybe before we get started, we want to get to know you a little bit, and along as we go today, we're going to help you kind of get to know us, so you can kind of place what we're going to say today. Um, on the shelf in your kind of lives as it best pertains to you. Uh, so uh, we'll kind of maybe be introducing what our firm is and what our perspective is as we go along. But uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Um, how many of you are, are you all business majors? Raise your, show hand. raise your hand if you're business. Anyone here that is not a business That was the question major. I should have asked. A couple. Um, okay, so what's your, what major? I'm a dual major, so piano performance and then also business, business as well. Sisters in the music business, there's a hand back here, not in what you want. Say again? Public relations. Public relations, okay, that's good. Well, everybody needs a little business though, because when it gets down to it, all of you are going to work in a business. So. How, many of you, how many of you are from Utah County? When you came to school, you didn't really move. And how many of you are from out of state? Okay, who's the furthest away? Florida. Florida. Who's Florida? Anyone further in Florida? Bulgaria. Where? <laughs> Brazil. Brazil? Russia, Brazil. Anybody beat Brazil? Thailand. Thailand? I don't know. Which is further? Thailand. I think Thailand's a winner. We like to reward winners there, so there you go. Pass them around, share with your friends. That's pretty good. <laughs> hey, uh, so I have a question. I attended a high school in a very small town, I had 48 in my graduating class in high school. Any of you beat that? Fewer than 48. Okay, who's close? 48. No one can beat 48. Oh, come on. That's really bad. Anybody under 500 graduating class? Okay, so we got a few. Under 300. Under 200. Okay, how many? 42. Yeah, so you beat 48. Where? At 42? I'm from Idaho. Idaho. Okay, well, how many in here? Oh, you got water. <laughs> Pass them back. Make sure she shares, okay? All right, 42. Wow. And I thought, like, the only thing that I can say would be different, you can't beat this, is we had 48, only 16 girls. I don't know how many girls we had. So 32 guys, 16 girls. <laughs> Anyway, so we're glad to be here at UVU. We love this school. I've had six kids attend this school, so it's pretty close to my heart. Um, I love UVU because it has the Hall of Scrutiny. You all you know the hall I'm talking about down here, the flags, the, the, and you walk down this Hall of Scrutiny, and people are sitting on the side, and you get this creepy feeling that they're judging you as you walk past. <laughs> <laughs> put a score on you or something or other, whatever. Anyway, so we thought if you don't get anything else from today's lecture, we want to give you a little dating advice. <laughs> because you at least take something you can use in Your real life. Your businesses may crash in flames of glory, but you know, at least you can take some dating advice. Okay, so here's the dating advice. This is from Alan, and he's 10 years old. So well, who should you decide to marry? You've got to find someone who likes the same stuff. Like, if you like sports, she should like it that you like sports. And she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> okay, and then Lynn. Lynn is eight years old, and she said, why do people go on dates? Well, dates are for having fun, and people should use them to get to know each other. Even boys have something to say if you listen long enough. <laughs> is that fair? That balances the scale a little bit. Anyway, so there's, there's some good advice for well, Kevin, let's get started. Uh, Kevin, did you play this high school of 48 graduate? Did you play sports? Well, did they, they have had public schools back they, then? They did have public schools back then. Well, and they, yes, they did play sports. You had to. Everybody had to play I sports. See. So I played football, track, basketball. I basketball. see. I see. Okay. And uh, do you think that you could still run the 100 yard dash? I'm pretty sure I can still run 100 yard dash. Pretty good. Okay, but could you do it without puking at the end of the 100-yard dash? Um, yeah. Well, 
Come to think that the last time I raced one of my sons, I pulled a muscle and I couldn't walk for a week. So <laughs> it was pretty bad. All right, so how about a marathon? A marathon. Ooh. The closest that I've come to running a marathon is watching my wife run a marathon. <laughs> Which must have been exhausting, I'm sure. Uh, two, two hours in a lawn chair would be enough. Well, uh, it was hot, the, the sun would beat down on me. Sarah. Well, um, I'm assuming that when she went out to run this marathon, she didn't just do it on a whim? Oh, no. In fact, in fact, it took about nine or ten months of training and planning. In fact, there were three, three or four, four women in the group. They all did it together, and they all ran the marathon together. They did it down at the <coughs> St. George Marathon. Okay, they made so it. All of them made it. So that kind of starts off what we want you to get from today. In a nutshell, we hope that what you absorb is being in business for the long run. So among all the talk about hot ideas and get rich quick schemes, it's time to talk about building a business that will last. And who better to do it and to count the benefits of, of doing that than a couple of CPAs. Our firm has been around for 60 years, and we monitor the financial performance of 5,000 clients. And we do it every year for as long as they let us. And we watch them grow, we watch them change. In some cases, we've watched businesses go for more than two generations. Yeah, so, in fact, we have in our vault downstairs, we have some files. And in those files, when they started the firm in 1951, and in those files, there is a file for several clients that we still have today. So they stayed with us from the very, very beginning. Along the way, we've seen businesses go big, and we've seen businesses go home. Sometimes in flames, uh, not very often in flames of glory. And so what we want to give to you today is the perspective of being in business for the long run. Because frankly, who better to do it than those in the industry that watch businesses go from year to year. So um, I believe that you can trust this perspective that we'll give to you today. We'll talk a little bit about it. You don't want to be the guy who pukes or pulls a hamstring at the end of 100 years. That's, that's right. You know, and we love working with new businesses. We love working with entrepreneurs. I mean, where else are you going to find people that only have to work half a day? <laughs> half a day? Are you telling me that people start a business so they can only work half days? Well, you're saying half of 24 hours. 12, 12, 12, hours, 12 a day. hours a okay, day. Okay, 12, right. hours, 12 a day. hours a day. Uh, observing my uh, self employed clients, those who are entrepreneurs, I'd say that's about right. Yeah, and isn't, isn't that one of the great myths of business that you, that you start your own business so ah. you only have to work part time? I love to hear you say the word myths because that introduces one of our favorite shows, my favorite shows, Discovery Channel's Mythbusters. So for a few brief moments, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to think of us as Jamie Heineman and Adam Savage, and we're going to bust some common myths about owning your own business. Hey, okay, great. And I don't know whether we're messing you up, Scott. We're, we're too spread apart. We need yeah. to... Yeah, we need to. We you want need me to come to, over here? We need to get a little bit closer, I think, so we can yeah, come over here. Okay, let's talk about let's talk about that first myth, that myth that I start my own business. I really don't have to work very hard. You know, I I can just manage my way to success. So um, I I will tell you that as a CPA, I see this not infrequently. Um, I I think that there we see enough examples of people who hit it big. And they hit it maybe big early. And they hit some lucky strikes along the way. But I think those of us who are planning to go into business have to be careful that we don't bank on that model. Now you may. You may get lucky along the way. And we hope that you have some lucky breaks. But if what you're planning to do is to somehow get discovered, to be in the right place at the wrong time, we think you're going to be left short of that expectation. Yeah, and you know, I, you don't want to sell that short. Doing nothing is actually pretty hard work because you never know when you're done. Uh, doing nothing is very, very hard work. That's very true. Um, 
Hey, who needs so them? Worry about the long haul. Let's talk about. Let's talk about it. Um, um, we've got a statistic here. Um, the average millionaire in the U.S. took 17.3 years and worked 60 to 70 hours. A lot of people don't realize that. The media really focuses on you know, the, the, the amazing person or the big story. And you hear enough of those stories that you begin to think that it's happening all over the place. But it's really true. 17, over 17 years for the average person to, for the average millionaire, accumulate a million dollars worth of assets. That's the way it usually is done. Now, there are some that do it faster. But when they talk about all the big politics stuff, about the 1% and the 5% and that kind of thing, it's really true. These big winners are very, very rare. And they, they do it out of a whole lot of hard work. And this 60, 70 hours a week happens time and time again. We see this constantly. So I, let, let me tell you about, uh, well, let's, let me, let's talk, talk about, about this example. Let's talk about the example. Yeah. Um, how many of you have seen In Concert the Blue Man Group? A few of you. Okay, for those of you that have seen it, what, how would you describe their show? Energy. Energy. You can't describe their show. <laughs> Completely random. <laughs> it is. So My favorite part is the marshmallow thing. I mean, how did that guy catch the marshmallow? It's just impossible. I don't know if it's amazing. So th yeah. those of you who haven't seen the show, I think probably most of you are familiar with the Blue Man Group. Um, let me just kind of just tell you a little bit about it here. Um, they've been around for a while. The, the Blue Man Group took 10 years to become the overnight success that they really did kind of ev eventually become. Uh, for the first three years, these three friends got together. For the first three years, they were performing six days a week, and they did 1,200 consecutive shows. Um, they, weren't, they weren't about an easy ride. So it harkens back to this idea that when you go in for business for yourself, you really better strap in and get ready to work hard because it's just it's one of the ingredients. You know, another example is Facebook. Now, Facebook, Facebook actually began in 2004. Some of you weren't even in junior high then. And 2004 is a generation away in computer time. But people seem to forget, as spectacular as it is today, people forget that it started in 2004, and it wasn't until 2009 that they actually saw they were in the black the first time. The first time they had positive cash flow was five years down the road. So this whole myth about Managing not having success, to work hard. Don't have to work hard. What do you say? Busted. That one's busted. It really is. Busted. Okay, let's talk about another myth. And this myth is the one that says, if you give me enough money, I will succeed. So let me, on the way down, Kevin and I were talking, and I, I told him, um, I feel like, you know, in the, in the work that I do as a consultant and as a, as a CPA, I see examples of a business who got funded, which got funded, and uh, executives there who are working, and that business is losing altitude faster than they will ever be able to regain. I mean, they have proven they are going out of business. But the executive who's managing that business does not pull the plug. So my question for you is, why? Why? Escalating commitment. If it's obvious to me, Say why? Again. Escalating commitment. Tell me more. Escalating commitment. He said, well, it's just you put enough resources that you can't stop me thinking, oh, if I keep working, maybe we'll come back. Whereas you're emotionally attached to the project, whereas the repetition will be the full flow. The emotional attachment is a big part of it. It really is. We, I think we see that a lot. You can't give up on your baby. You know, you just can't do it. <laughs> Other thoughts? Um, I'll, tell you another, I'll tell you another reason, and I've observed it. Uh, the, he who is managing the business is not he who funded it. And he's got a job for the next two years drawing $110,000 out. And so he's, he's just sucking the thing dry of the investor's money. As long as he can convince the investors to, to keep putting money in, then that's his job. His job is selling investors to put money in a business. So um, 
my, my warning is that is not entrepreneurship, but it's a vacuum that any one of you could get sucked into because it is emotional. Because if you're in that position and you're funded, it could be very difficult to make the hard entrepreneurial decisions you've got to make to run your business. You know, another example is Solyndra. How many of you know the Solyndra story? Is this a familiar to any of you? Okay, so how much? Renewable how much? energy company. 500 borrows money, 500, borrow money, 500 uh, over 500 million dollars, <coughs> and what happened to them? Did we know? Bankrupt. Bankrupt. They're bankrupt. I just I had to look on the uh, online. I, a story popped up today. I just printed it off. Here's one that makes these guys look like pikers. Solar Trust of America received 2.1 billion, 2.1 billion dollars in government loans. They went bankrupt yesterday. Oh. Yeah, but uh, what they don't tell you is that China put in $30 billion into their solar industry, which is kind of hard to compete with, and that's why they... Well, the, the point is, it isn't about the money, it's about what you do with it. Like, for example, I have a client who, who locally, who just sold his business for $20 million. That's a pretty nice payout, wouldn't you say? It's a nice one. What you don't know is he has been working for 10 years, he put in $10 million of his own money, and he raised... $40 million of capital along the line. So that $20 million payout doesn't look so good anymore, does it? So this idea that all you got to have is enough money and then you're going to succeed, what do you say? Bust. That one doesn't work either. It's just simply not true. Let's look at myth number three. And this myth is strike three for a lot of companies. And it is that... Uh, pardon? The second busted or? Yeah, it's busted. Oh, yeah. Busted. Busted. <laughs> the, sec the, the third one is that I don't really need to do any planning. I just gotta, I just gotta be nimble and quick and react, and I just gotta go with my gut. So um, I, I know and I acknowledge that the move right now in, in business development and entrepreneurial development is prototype to be quick on your feet to get out on the street to try something and when it works pivot and do something else even so the, the best businesses that I see they have a plan and if you walk up to those owners and ask them where are you going they can tell you now it may change it may change rapidly but they know and they have a plan because that's their job as the entrepreneurs to provide that vision and the direction and the plan of where things are going. I, uh, I want to point out one of the things that come from that plan is focus. So I'm aware of, uh, of an individual who has a business uh, fixing clocks and silk screen and building custom motorcycles. Okay, now wait a minute, wait a minute. So he silk screens t-shirts and he fixes, fixes clocks, clocks and he builds custom and he builds motorcycles. Custom motorcycle. And you know, I mean you can guess what he's about, right? Yeah, yeah. This guy doesn't really want to work. He's hoping that he's gonna hit a home run with one of these businesses and then he won't really have to work. Well, um, I'll share and I and I got this client's permission to share this. I said, can I tell he's a good guy and he's he's aggressive on risk taking. I said, can I share what your QuickBooks password is? And he said, yeah, that's fine. It's crapshoot, is his QuickBooks password. <laughs> and and um, he's already left one business, um, just abandoned, and he's on to his next one. He's got a very high risk tolerance. Okay, don't he's not building guy. a business for the long run. Don't be that guy. Planning on having a lightning strike is not a business plan. That's not a plan. So you need to have a real plan. So this whole idea that you don't have to plan that maybe lightning is going to strike. It's busted. That one's busted. It just doesn't work. <coughs> now, uh, it's important to recognize building a business, running a business, is like sailing in stormy waters. It's treacherous. It's dangerous. And in fact, when or if the ship wrecks, it's, it's an awful catastrophe and sometimes ruins the financial life of owners or the family or friends who invested in it. It's never a pretty thing. Never, ever a pretty thing. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to talk about a little bit now about what you need to do. Some of the things that you must do to build a solid foundation so that you can 
to get real here, we're, we can build things so that they're really going to last. No more pie in the now, sky. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I mean, Kevin, that sounds like an account talking now, like Sean said at the beginning. Are you saying that it's not okay to dream? Because these people are entrepreneurs. You know, one time I had a dream. Are you saying they can't be dreamers? <laughs> That better be on a scale of one to four. One to four. Right. Okay. No, okay. You can have a dream, but you have to make a budget first. And you have to let your accountants approve it. <coughs> All right, Rainbow Killer. Let's talk about must do number one. It's okay to be passionate. It's okay to be visionary. In fact, you've got to be that way. Because it's going to take you through late nights and all the struggles along the way. Get your vision. You gotta have fire in your belly. This is your first and last job as an entrepreneur. It's to have that vision and to have that passion. And that, the reason is no one else can be counted on to do that but you. You're the only person that can drive that that way. It will you'll have a lot of tough times, there's no question about that. When you're working, it doesn't matter whether you have your own business or whether you're trying to build your career. You're going to have some difficult times. And if you don't have focus, if you don't have that vision of what you want to accomplish, when times get tough, you'll be tempted to just give up and try something else. And that's not the path to success either. You want, you really need to stay tenacious and try to stay in things. Let me say a word on focus. Um, your time, and your resources, and your opportunities are limited. They're absolutely limited. And that's why focus becomes key. Your success is most often the product of sustained focus. And it's true in your lives. I mean, you can feel that. If I were to ask about those of you that have been athletes and, and students and whatever you've achieved that you've been successful at, in most cases, it's going to be the product of sustained focus. True. And then you've got to have good planning. The next core value, value is starts with you. This core value is all about you. Your integrity, your honesty, your your desire for knowledge and, and intelligence, these are absolutely critical. In fact, in our company, we say it's never just business. It's always personal. So Because that's where it starts. Keeping it personal, what does that mean? It means <coughs> that for us, it means we're friends with our clients. It means that we're interested in what they do. In very many cases, we know the names of their spouses and their, and their children. It also means that what we say is important to us as our word and we like to do business on a handshake when we can, and we, and we will do that. So part of our core values is that it is personal for us. We don't hide behind contracts. We want people to rely on us and what we do. Great. And you know, all of this starts at the very top. And the tone that you set, whether you have your own business, whether you're a supervisor over others, the tone you set is what the others can follow. And I had some great examples. Uh, about 20 years ago, one of my clients was a contractor sold these modular homes, you know, the ones that are built on a factory line and then they haul them in and set them on a foundation, they're pre-built. He bought a home from a company that went bankrupt. In fact, he bought the very last home that came off their line, the very last home. It declared bankruptcy right after they delivered that home and he had put it on and sold it. Well, he owed them about $30,000, but they had no company left. It was a bankruptcy trustee. So he tried for two years to get an invoice so he could pay for this home that he had purchased. And finally, he got a hold of the bankruptcy trustee, and the trustee said, oh, this thing's all done. Just forget it. Just forget it. But he couldn't forget it. He, he finally just wrote a check for $30,000 and sent it to the bankruptcy trustee. Now, this guy had a pickup truck and not much else, but he had a whole wagon load of integrity. And it was a great example to me because he could have used that money, but he knew it wasn't him. So he sent it on even though he didn't know what was going to happen to it. He'd done what he needed to do. I'll give you another example that came up uh, as I'm preparing tax returns with my clients this year. Uh, one of my clients describes to me the following situation. Years ago, made an investment so my kids would have a place to work, bought a restaurant, chain, and after a while, gosh, that was a bad idea. It was just too high maintenance. <laughs> You'll notice this that restaurants are like having a baby that never grows up. That's true too. It's like having a two-year-old the rest of your life. <laughs> you remember one thing today. 
Um, how many of your have families in restaurant business now? They do. I mean, isn't it true? It's like a baby that never grows up. I mean, they're they're. I have two neighbors that are restaurateurs, and they love them. But holy cow! You have to be passionate. You, you got to be passionate about that. You got to be passionate. So this client comes in. He describes to me the situation. We bought this. We bought this restaurant. So we have the kids have a place to work. And it uh, didn't work out, so I went to my partner, and I said, hey, buy me out. And so he did, and our agreement was, I'm done, right? I'm done and I'm out of this. But he got tangled up. He did not get his name off of a bank account. His name, when the business bought a building, his name was on that building. And eight or 10 years later, now that partner, who, who the business is now in the ground, the, bit, the bank is coming back to my client saying, you're on the hook for this. And you're the only guy with any money left because he had the smarts to get out. So they're coming to him for all the money. Well, what did they do? I mean, he was beside himself. This guy was more fiscally conservative than probably any client I have. And now he's going to have to come out of pocket for $80,000 on a business that he sold to his partner, gave to him, said, you're off. it's you, man. What did he do? He pulled money, he pulled $80,000 out of his 401k, and, and, he, and he paid the debt. Now that's perhaps not so remarkable because the bank could have shook it, turned him upside down and shook him for it. The remarkable thing is that both he and his wife went to that partner and decided, we're not gonna be resentful about it, we're not gonna be angry about it, we're gonna stay friends. And they put their arms around him and said, it's only money. It's only money, our friendship matters more than that. And that's a remarkable thing. And that attitude reflects in everything you do in your business. It affects your customers, it affects your coworkers. It's critical. That starts with you. It's really, really important. Now, don't guess wrong. You've got to make a profit. Uh, but caring about your people and your customers doesn't mean that you just let that part go. So what you're running is a business. Competition is a good thing. You need it to excel. Just remember cannibals are competitive too, just not in the way. Great, so let's talk about number three, get good advice. The school of hard knocks is attended by people who think they know everything. And those people that think they know everything really annoy those of us who do know everything. <laughs> but they're attended by people who think they know everything or they're too cheap to get good advice, but, and they're not willing to change their way. They're gonna do it their own way. So, get you a good board of advisors. <coughs> Put people on there that you know, know their stuff, that you trust. Listen to their advice and follow it. Most of the time. Most of the time. I mean, remember, this is your business. You're the entrepreneur, you're the leader, right? You've gotta develop your instincts. You've gotta be able to go with your gut. So yes, yeah, surround yourselves with good advice and listen to them most of the time. All right. Okay, let's go back uh, to these guys we talked about just a minute ago. The Blue Man Group. We want to talk about what it is that makes the Blue Man Group really different. But, but before we go into that, we want to remind you that there was another famous group. So who, who remembers these guys? I used to have them. Hey, we only had four hands go up. Who does not know who these people are? Okay, Siegfried and Roy. Have you heard that name before, Siegfried and Roy? Siegfried and Roy. These guys, let me just tell you a little bit about good old Siegfried and Roy. There's a reason why many of you don't know them, okay? Uh, they were billed as the most visited show in Las Vegas. Uh, in 2001, they signed a lifetime contract with the Mirage, the resort down in Vegas. They appeared in nearly 6,000 shows together. These two guys and a white tiger. They had this magic show. It's 6,000 shows together. Were they making money? Yes, they were making money. Okay, give me an idea of how quickly things change. We talked a minute ago about Facebook. Facebook started in 2004. These guys finished up in 2003. So that tells you how long, how quickly things can really change. They're completely forgotten now to most of you. have no idea who these people are. Yet they were just at the top of their game back in 2003, one day. And the next day? Well, among the performer world, Siegfried and Roy, I mean, they've made it, right? Um, 
and they were making money and they, they have their gig down. But the problem with their gig is it was driven by Siegfried and Roy. And unfortunately, in 2003, Roy was injured on stage by a tiger. You remember the incident? Yeah. He drug him off stage by his neck. Severus jugular. I mean, this was not a good, was not a good way to promote uh, crowd pleasing kinds of behavior. And remember when they did their their show? There was not a cage in front of the <coughs> stage, right? I mean, the tiger was on stage. Because these tigers were safe. And dragged the train off stage. Okay, so show was over. And it and it and it. That's true. That's not a prediction. The show was over. Well, but didn't they try to replace Roy? Well, sure, they had plenty of people who wanted to replace Roy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that it wasn't the same without Roy. That's all I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> Can you say that? There's something wrong with the hair. <laughs> There's something wrong with more than the hair. <laughs> okay. So yes, let's talk about the Blue Egg Group. The Blue Egg Group is a much this, better this, example. And it's not nearly as disturbing. Not nearly as disturbing, which is amazing that guys with no hair and their blue faces are not disturbing, that. but apparently <laughs> it's true. So let's, let's kind of think about these guys in opposition to the model of Siegfried and Roy, okay? How are we doing on time? We have about 15 minutes, so let's Okay, so at first, these guys saw themselves as ordinary performers like anybody else. When they got started, as I said, they did all the 1,200 consecutive performers, three guys only, and the same three guys every time. Their producer got nervous, and one of them could get sick, and they were booked, they were booked up eight weeks out in advance, they never canceled a show, and, and the producer said, you gotta have an understudy. So they got an understudy, and uh, lo and behold, one of the three fooling around with a router, <coughs> cut his hand, and the understudy had to go on. And he'd never done it before. He had never even rehearsed. The understudy had never even rehearsed the show. These guys were not about scaling or using, using like what they had right before. Them. The interesting thing here now, we really, if you didn't catch this, they were worried about one of the three performers getting injured, so they brought in an understudy in case somebody couldn't perform. That's where their focus was. That was as far as the horizon went. And it was only at the demand of, of their producer. In fact, um, in the first month they performed, way back when, the very first month that they performed, another performer came up to them after the show, a separate guy, and said, you guys are brilliant. You guys can clone yourselves. And they said, hold on, cowboy. And they thought he was crazy. They said, no, no, we're more like a rock band. That's, that's who we are. And they, they shied away from this. Well, the understudy stepped in. The understudy worked. Now. And nobody knew the difference. No one could tell. Surprise. When, you, when you're wearing a latex hat and a blue face, it's really hard to identify people. So I'll make a prediction. If some of you become entrepreneurs and you work hard and you become successful in what you do, it's natural to settle into your role, right? I mean, it's natural. Now you're the best at that thing. Then why would you leave it? The flashback to when these guys got caught in that same trap. Change is hard, okay? It's very difficult. Now, I understand that someone's got to blaze the trail, right? Someone's got to make the business. Someone has to turn it into something and get the momentum and the traction at that. And once you've done it, as an entrepreneur, it puts you in a very unique position to provide the vision, to do it again, to do it elsewhere. Now you're the expert in the world on what that is. So it's not enough just to be a trailblazer. And we see it. We see people who have been excellent at blazing that trail. They've become good at it. And that's where things stop. It's not enough to be a trailblazer. You've got to be a scaler. Now, you You've know, I learned how to scale. I saw Blue Man Group, oh, it's been, I would say, about eight years ago, something like that. And I had no idea. I thought I was seeing the Blue Man Group in Las Vegas. It's a fantastic show. If you ever get a chance to see it or you see it on TV or something, it's, it's just absolutely, you can't describe it. It's just an incredible show. It's really fun. But I was, I had no idea that I wasn't seeing the one and only Blue Man Group. It, they were that good at reproducing themselves. So real quick, here's what it means to us. We have a saying in our office, think blue. 
let me tell you just real quick what it means to us. We've just got a couple points here I'm going to roll through. It means reliable processes and systems. It means trust the capability of other people. It means be accountable for what you're doing, and it means you've got to work together. That's what it means to us to be thinking who. I think, I think it's amazing when we look at, at the, who the Blue Man Group really is. But they, they went from these four people with three originals and an understudy to 70 different performers. One's an African American, another one was actually a woman. They had a woman as a blue, blue gal, no, the blue man. Well, Nobody knew. Blue man. You're in this black outfit, you're wearing the thing. So, who really knew who it was? So, now they have over 500 employees, they have 3,000 shows a year. It's just absolutely stunning. When I think about the Blue Man Group, that's not just three people on the stage. That was a hundred people would find the performance. When you see it, they have a band, they have actors, they have people in and out. It's, they duplicated their whole organization ten times. They had ten shows going simultaneously. So that's so it's absolutely amazing. Would you say, I mean, would you agree that's kind of exciting? I mean, it's kind of exciting to see performers in the most unlikely industry take this to this kind of a, of a level. Now, let me just say, here are your warnings. What is going to keep you from thinking blue? Number one, it feels like more time. And that's the last thing you have, but it's the first thing you have to prioritize, is the time that you're spending. Number two, your customers are not going to pay for your employee manual. In the first couple of years, when you're running low on cash, they're not paying for it. <coughs> so how's it going to come about? However, they'll pay for it in the next year. So if you're thinking on a long haul, these are things you build as you can. And then finally, the thing that keeps you from thinking blue, it's just simply, it's not the path of least resistance, right? So when I say that, what I want to come into your mind is, it's discipline. This is about being a disciplined business leader, a disciplined entrepreneur, in order to build the systems and the processes that will make your business go for the long run. Okay, we want to show a video to you that it illustrates something very, very interesting. Uh, it's called change blindness. So I think we are going to flip the lights off on this because we want to, want everybody to see this very clearly, and I want you to watch it very clearly. Okay. This is Derek Brown. He's a performer. First of all, things were pretty observant. But with a bit of mind control, I wanted to see if I could make these people take even the most obvious things for granted. Anyway, uh, Trinity Church is it? Might be Wall of Kingdom, by the way. Okay. We're down here somewhere, aren't we? Yeah. We try to put the right. Uh, yeah. Did you see it? Uh, you saw it, raise your hand. We keep going that way. We have about three that saw it. Okay, we'll make it easier in a minute. <clears throat> that seemed almost too easy. So later on, I see how far I can take it. Excuse me, do you know where that Trinity Church is? Okay. Last time I switched with someone who looked a little bit like me, but where's the fun in that? You see it? Who sees it now? Raise your hand. The other side. Yeah, the other side. So you don't know where it is. Okay, okay. Now those of you that still don't get it, you will get it this time.
We have to go. Thank you. We have to go. She knows there's something wrong. Now she's talking to what's the young lady now? What? What? <laughs> the older lady saw it. Okay. Sorry. It's the last one. Change blindness. Why didn't they see this? <coughs> Why? Yeah. Thoughts. Why didn't they see it? Yeah. The focus was too narrow. Focus was too narrow. You're not expecting it. Weren't what expecting it. it. Just happened. Put you in front of your Who would expect that? Okay. In fact, I think the, I, the older lady. I think she was like thinking she was going to get mugged. Probably yeah. Before she. Was she up, was aware. Right? She's watching she was around. Yeah. And she she said, "We got to go. Get out of here." And then she tells it. She wasn't focused on the map. She was focused on everything around her. <coughs> as clear as a bell. Here. Why else? Why are people blind to change? Why else? Maybe there. Somebody talked over here uh, in the plaid shirt. You talked about being invested in your company. Yeah. Emotionally invested, so that you deny change is there. You just deny it's even happening. Yeah. The way I looked at it as I was watching it, when the people switch, it's like when we have our company and you're there, and then someone comes in and replaces you just like that. It's like you built the company the way it's supposed to run, and it just it works off the system, I like and it that. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's there because the company will continue to run itself. That's pretty deep. I like that. Okay. That's Pass it back. That's <laughs> it is. Okay. And and you know what? Um, it, it can be unexpected, or things are just the same except for that one little thing that didn't change. You know, another thing is training. I don't know how many of you have, have learned a new language. How many of you have more than one language? Now, in, in learning that language, were there certain sounds that you had a very difficult time making? You couldn't make the sound because you couldn't hear it properly. Your ear had not been trained to hear that sound. And because you could not hear it, you can't duplicate it. You had to be trained to hear the sound. Is that correct? Those of you that have learned another language, you had to learn to hear it before you could hear it. Well, in business, you've got to see it before you can understand what happens to it. So it can be trained for you to see it. And then there's another one, is a bias. That bias can come from either your upbringing, from your experiences, it can come from your training. But you can have a bias to deny that something is happening because you don't, don't believe it, you don't want to see it happening. So all of those things can cause us to be blind to change. So. When you're focused and you're intent and you're working hard on this company to make it go, don't let them switch a woman for the guy, or a black guy for a white guy, or for a bald guy for a guy with hair. Be aware of what's happening around you. Be don't be don't be blind to these changes that happen. You know, Stephen Covey talks about this in terms of paradigm. We're getting stuck in a paradigm, and uh, so that's so that's some caution. I think for a business that needs to be. In, in, in for longer than just today, longer than uh, just enough time to have you know an acquisition or some kind of liquidated event. Uh, build it, build it to last, and uh, have the counsel you need to be able to avoid those paradigm traps that come. Well, we got about three minutes left, so if there are any questions, I think we'll take those. We got a couple other things we can talk about, but I don't think we're going to be able to take longer. So, any questions? That you want to ask? Yeah, in the back. Great presentation. I, I just wondered how you guys were able to get away from the offices. <laughs> <laughs> you met your dad in accountant? Uh, no, I have a lot of family that are. Yeah. yeah. We yeah, have we six. We have family. 60 people back in the office. They're all wearing blue hats <laughs> and blue faces. That's why we can get away. With you got to be there to we sign the return. We have a great firm, and, yeah. and uh, we have a great firm. We have we have systems in place. Everything needs to be done a certain way. And we stay on our system, so we've got our own little blue man group. Any other questions? Yeah. So 
if we're looking at us starting small businesses as back. entrepreneurs, uh, if we're looking for that advice and like we want to have an accountant, but money's so tight, it's just this is this balance of things like that. How do you work with that with your clients or how do you that we work with that? Good question. The question for those of you who didn't hear, I mean, when you start a business, the last thing you have is time and money, right? And that's the last thing you have. How do you how do you, how do we do it? We know we gotta have good advice and good counsel. Um, I'll say this, I mean, for our firm, we try to price ourselves in a way for new, new businesses that are starting so that it can make sense. So as soon as you have just a little idiot's bit of traction, that you can come in and use us. And, and frankly, your CPA is a really great investment. When you spend the couple hundred dollars a year that you'll spend with a CPA, to be able to call them up when you have a question or acquisition or something, a transaction is happening, it just pays for itself. Uh, multiple times over. So you got to pay for a tax return. I mean, it's got to be done. So choose a CPA who can be your consultant ad hoc when you need it, when something comes up, and if you're killing two birds with one stone. Okay. Well, got time for one more question if there's another one. Okay, good. Thank you. We appreciate being here.